Welcome to Crash Concepts, where the economy, energy, and the environment are explored. Up next, fresh ideas and insights into the factors that are driving the world and shaping your future. Presenting information you can't afford to live without, here's Chris Martinson. Welcome to this peakprosperity.com podcast. I am your host, Chris Martinson. You know, one of the core tenets of resiliency is being and staying healthy. And of course, we've all heard that you are what you eat, but our understanding of what that really means is growing by leaps and bounds. And more to the point, you are as healthy as what you eat. Curing a disease is not nearly as important as avoiding that disease in the first place. But if you are unhealthy, then curing that takes precedence over everything else. Fortunately, both of these conditions, staying healthy and curing disease, can be addressed in many cases by being selective about what you eat. More and more, we are beginning to appreciate the role of food's impact on metabolic processes and how that initiates or modifies both health and certain disease conditions. Well, today's podcast is about how we can make the right eating choices for robust health, and that begins by understanding the context and the scientific data that undergirds this growing awareness. Speaking with us today is David Seaman, Professor of Clinical Sciences at the National University of Health Sciences, Florida site in Pinellas Park, where he teaches evaluation and management courses for the musculoskeletal and cardiorespiratory systems, as well as, this is the biggie, nutrition. Graduate of Rutgers University and New York Chiropractic College, master's degree in nutrition from the University of Bridgeport, David authored a book on clinical nutrition for pain and inflammation and has written several chapters and articles on this topic. Now, in 2002, he wrote the first detailed clinical article that described the relationship between diet and inflammation. Started studying the connection between diet and inflammation way back in 1987. His website is dflame.com, that's D-E-F-L-A-M-E.com, and he is currently working on a new book for the general public, David. Welcome to the program. Thanks for having me on, Chris. Well, now much of your work centers on the role of inflammation and its role in promoting unhealthy conditions. So let's start there. What is inflammation? You know, inflammation is kind of interesting depending upon um, your one's training. If you speak to healthcare practitioners, and this could be uh, myself as a chiropractor, but medical doctors, physical therapists, uh, across the board, we all learn inflammation out of um, usually a, a common physiology book called Guidance Physiology. That's the biggest one. There's about three pages in there on inflammation and there's about three pages in there on pain. And that's the extent of our learning regarding pain and inflammation before we get into how to treat various conditions. So there's a big gap in there. And when you look at inflammation in that context, it is always described in the context of an infection or an overt injury like a sprained ankle where you see obvious swelling, uh, it can get warm, and the outcome then is this very obvious and it's painful. And that is not inflammation related to diet. Inflammation related to diet is a very, very subtle process. So, for example, just waking up in the morning, going over to the coffee shop and having a donut, that actually leads to low-grade inflammation after you eat, but you just don't feel it. So they're two very distinct processes. And the problem with the dietary one is that it basically builds up on us over time. And then out of the blue, we can be diagnosed with any number of possible diseases and think, I wonder what caused this. And it was the last 20 or 30 years or 10 years, depending upon how aggressive one was in their pursuit of the disease. I call it pursuing disease with dietary inflammation. So depending upon how aggressive one is, it can appear, but the cause-effect relationship is lost because compared to a sprained ankle or a bee sting, you don't do a drive-by self-shooting, as I call that, a fast food restaurant, and all of a sudden feel aches and pains everywhere. It takes time to progress. So you have the acute inflammation with an injury that's very obvious, and then you have the more subtle, low-grade inflammation that you can't even feel initially. So uh, I love knowing how things work. What is the process of inflammation? I know this could get very, very complicated. We, we don't need all the biochemical uh, processes, but but generally speaking, when we're talking about inflammation, you, you mentioned that if I twist my ankle, I'm going to feel the heat, I'm going to feel the swelling, I'm going to feel the pain. Uh, what is going on in that type of inflammation? How does that differ maybe from chronic inflammation, or is there any difference between low-grade, chronic, or, or acute inflammation, or are they the same processes? Well, they're, they're, they're generally the same. 
It's just that with an acute scenario, there's actual tissue injury and it's much more robust, much mm-hmm. more overt versus subtle. So for the chronic inflammation example, you know, you go and you do it again, drive-by self-shooting, or you stop by the coffee shop and have a whatever you're going to have, a, a bagel with butter and a cup of coffee or tea, and then you leave and have a donut. What that will cause after you eat it, so postprandially after we eat it, we'll get a surge of blood sugar because mm-hmm. we just consumed a refined carbohydrate. Mm-hmm. That surge of blood sugar is going to get dumped into uh, muscle, and that will take place as a consequence of insulin being released. But then that surge of blood sugar is typically not normal for us to experience based upon our genetic disposition in terms of food sources. So you'll have um, rapid movement of the blood sugar into immune cells, for example. And when the immune cells get hit with this high blood sugar surge, they generate free radicals. And these free radicals uh, lead to the production by the immune cell of inflammatory chemistry. So there's an immediate inflamm- a postprandial, post-eating inflammatory response to hyperglycemia. It's subtle dietary trauma versus overt physical trauma. Now, what I just heard you say is that ordinary table sugar is an inflammatory compound. Yes. And so where do we find ordinary table sugar besides in a, a jar on our table? That's in sodas. It's in... Uh, pretty much everything that you could possibly imagine that has uh, glucose written on the back of it? Yeah. You Anything look at the that's sugary or flowery. Sugars and flowers. In flowers, too. So refined oh, flowers. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So anything with a, with a refined starch in it and or uh, uh, table sugar, we're going to get that same inflammatory response is going to be kicked out. Yes. And how, how do we know that? How is that measured right now? That's the problem with this. Initially, it's hard to measure. Um, but there are subtle ways to do it through markers that are just not commonly used in clinical settings. So I'll give you a couple examples. Um, we do a, uh, they actually use this as a test meal, for example. They used uh, three pieces of, of, of white toast with mm-hmm. butter on it and a cup mm-hmm. of tea would be one test meal. And then they actually used a, a egg McMuffin, sausage McMuffin, and one of those deep fried hash brown patties, each equaling 900 calories. Mm-hmm. Now what you're looking at there is zero vegetation zero bioflavonoids, which help to kind of quell or calm down the, the inflammatory process. So they've identified two postprandial uh, ways to, uh, to, to measure this dietary inflammation. One is actually by measuring an elevation of something called bacterial endotoxin. Mm-hmm. And what that is, is the, this part of the cell wall of gram-negative bacteria that are in our small intestine. So Eating those foods causes us to get a low-grade endotoxemia, and it's been measured in lean 23, 24, 25-year-olds. Now, hold on. Uh, What's happening here? I I need to know this. So uh, these gram-negative bacteria, their cell walls are getting leaky, and and they're leaking some sorts of toxins in response to being hit with these inflammatories? Is is that the process, or or do you miss it? No, it's weird, right? (laughs) No, it goes like this. So so our gut gets hit with this refined flour, sugar, and lipid, fat. Yep. And an hour or two later, you can measure the blood and you can actually identify increases in bacterial endotoxins. So we, we uh, get a transient leaky gut event. Uh, yeah. yeah. And you may not feel anything. So when you're young and when you're a kid, you're playing baseball, running around, doing whatever you're doing, you don't really feel, you feel fine, you can't feel anything because it's low grade. But now here's what gets interesting. If we do this over time, they've actually identified this, um, five years, you know, following patients for five years. If you eat a anti-inflammatory diet, which is basically wild game, lean meat, fish, fowl, that type of stuff, mm-hmm. with veg- vegetables, fruits, and nuts, and then you compare that to a fast food type of diet, five years later, the fast food dieters much more likely to have depression. And there has actually been a correlation between progressively elevating levels of endotoxin with the expression of both diabetes and depression. Hmm. And so part of this process then, if you're eating these highly refined carbohydrates, I'll just sort of lump them in there. And you also mentioned lipids there uh, for, for a minute, so we'll get into that in a second. But these, at least if you're taking in these highly refined carbohydrates, you might get a leaky gut syndrome. You might get these bacterial endotoxins coming in. You keep that on long enough, and we're going to now find that you are more highly correlated with depression. And what was the other thing you mentioned? Diabetes. Diabetes. Type 1, or I mean type 2, I assume, right? Yeah, type 2. Type 2. Okay, so 
So how long does that have to go on uh, uh, before? Uh, so let me let me make sure I got this right. As long as people are on this regime of eating that kind of a diet, they are giving themselves low-grade inflammation, and in some co some part of that cohort, some part of that group, will go down a path of of having what we would call full-blown identifiable disease progression result out of that. Absolutely, it's well documented. Absolutely, and, and so it's a bell curve. So some people probably could do this quite a bit and, and not harm themselves, but other people are going to be more sensitive to it. Where do you think the center mass of the population is? is? Is this basically okay for the center mass, but it's only a problem for people at the edge of the bell curve? Or is this a problem for everybody, but maybe a very select few? I would say, I would say the latter. The latter. Yeah. And, and here's where you know you start moving into it. I would say that this would be a, an absolute marker that where it's obvious. This is where someone can maybe not feel necessarily sick yet, but this will happen to the average person once they go from being normal body weight their body mass index rises, and then you move to where they're overtly obese. And you don't need to be that large to be overtly obese. At some point, though, and I don't know where it is, it's all you know, individual, but around the time that your waistline starts to exceed your chest measurement, if you ask these people, after you eat and you feel full, does your brain tell you that you're still hungry even though you have a sensation of fullness? And if they say yes, you can bet that they've got multiple markers of inflammation that are elevated. That's a big sign of, actually, the hypothalamus in that case, the brain, hypothalamus becomes inflamed so that it does not respond to the satiating, you know, the, the feel-full signals that you're supposed to get from insulin and another hormone called leptin. So the whole body becomes inflamed. So what's, what's happened here, I mean, if you can identify that, that you still have uh, the sensation I'm going to say maybe the brain sensation of hunger, even though you have the stomach sensation of being full, this means that you are in a, in a metabolic state where you're probably inflamed to the point that your body is no longer processing signals appropriately. Exactly. All right. So we, we've talked about uh, these processed uh, carbohydrates. I just want to make sure we get the big buckets before we, we go into the next part of this. So we've got your, your basic starches and sugar itself. You mentioned a lipid before. Is that... Uh, what, were you, what were you referring to there? Yeah, the, the lipid part is, is interesting, and, 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 it's, and to me it's kind of a sensitive issue to talk about just because people have, have weird ideas about, about lipids because they think of cholesterol and triglycerides. And so the first thing to understand about cholesterol and triglycerides, and we'll get back to the other part of it, is that the best way to, you know, if you really want to get high cholesterol and high triglycerides, you eat a lot of sugar and flour. Mm -hmm. That's how you get high triglycerides, high cholesterol, because if you follow the pathway from eating refined carbohydrates, sugars, and flours, we convert it into glucose, and the glucose pathway from glucose goes right down, and it makes triglycerides, and it makes cholesterol. Hmm. And eat, this is really, you'll find this is pretty amazing, when you eat the refined carbohydrates, it turns on insulin, because your body needs to dump the, uh, the glucose. The insulin stimulates the enzyme that statins inhibit. Hmm. I'll say it again. So this enzyme called HMG-CoA reductase. So statins are HMG-CoA reductase inhibitors. HMG-CoA reductase is stimulated by insulin, which is stimulated by sugar. So when I say lipid, uh, I'm not referring, you know, when you eat fat, you tend not to get fat because fat kind of satiates you. When you eat fat, even saturated fat, uh, your HDL cholesterol tends to get better. But the problem is if you just take, for example, organic heavy cream, you know, made by the most magnificently taken care of cows, you drink heavy cream, that's all you do, you'll also get some endotoxin absorption because the body in nature is really designed to consume um, vegetation with our other sources of calories. Mm -hmm. It's just common. It's just done, done around the world like that forever and ever. So the gut is just not wired to just get pure lipid or pure starch or a combination of the two. And now if you add vegetation to both of those, you'll get less of an inflammatory response afterwards. Now, I also say that carefully because people say, okay, so I can go do a drive-by shooting and have some vegetable juice and I'll be fine. No, because those same calories will still screw you up slowly down the road, but you'll be less um, bad off if you add the vegetation 
to these more pro-inflammatory meals. So the lipid, when it's mixed with refined carbohydrate, that gives you a double dose of endotoxin, plus you get the high blood sugar response that initiates a similar uh, inflammatory reaction. That's measurable. That's measurable. Very interesting, and I need to back up just a second because I love that that part about the statin. So maybe a lot of people listening to this are or know somebody who's on a statin. So the idea of a statin is it targets a, a specific enzyme, HMG-CoA reductase, and down regulates that or, or shuts it down. And because of that, less lipid, uh, sorry, less cholesterol lipids are produced. And and so conventional science has said, wow, look at high cholesterol, and it's correlated with heart disease, atherosclerosis, stuff like that. So if we can just knock the cholesterol down, so what we're going to do is we're going to target this enzyme. The but that's going into the like um, that's shooting your 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 fire hose basically at the top of the fire because the bottom of the fire is the fact that that same enzyme is upregulated, is turned on because people are eating sugar. So the yes. way to actually have really targeted this, rather than taking a statin to try and short-circuit this thing in the middle of the path, is to not eat the sugar and the refined starches, correct? Exactly. Yeah, that, that's what, so as an aside, you know, say what you can as a practitioner in the field, but, but how is it that medical science that, you know, we're just going to pine here for a second. How is it that medical science uh, misses something like that? It, it's, that seems like a, a very Rube Goldberg way to go about something that could be more readily addressed through nutrition than a pill. Yeah, well, I've just been impressed, you know, in a sense where after, after um, hit my 50s, I'm like, you know, Everyone is prone to dogma and conditioning based upon their training. Mm -hmm. So if you're trained to think that eating fat will make you fat or if eating fat will elevate your cholesterol and there's some subtle associations and depending upon how you use statistics, which you know very well, you can look at something in terms of relative risk versus absolute risk and they're like they look innocuous from the absolute risk perspective. So it depends upon how you manipulate statistics. So here's the problem with this when you start looking at heart disease. They look at the end result. They see some people who are, the average person with diabetes or, or, or heart disease has bad cholesterol. But that's because of the sugar issue and the lack of exercise. Because the, 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 what, what causes, and you, you for, and all your listeners have heard this, it's the LDL that goes up and LDL they say is bad. The HDL goes down and they say, well, that's good. We're losing the good stuff. But that actually misses a huge part of the story. LDL is very good. HDL is very good. And both HDL and LDL can become pro-inflammatory. They can actually shift. They metabolically shift. And what makes them pro-inflammatory is sugar and flour and hmm. omega-6 fatty acids. Hmm. Yeah. So if you eat sugar, flour, and trans fats, you will elevate LDL and you will lower HDL. And if sugar stays uh, elevated long enough, like blood sugar stays elevated long enough, we now transform our LDL into a, a smaller, more dense LDL that's harder to uh, break down. Mm -hmm. And then it becomes oxidized. And now LDL cholesterol acts as a free radical. And then it, that's what damages and initiates the atherogenesis process. And it could be heart, brain, you know, peripheral arteries all over the place. So it's the sugar that does it. So we have these little hard, dense LDL particles uh, rummaging around, but they've been uh, radicalized in essence. You know, they've had a, yes, exactly. And then they're just from, like little tiny scrub brushes running around sort of abrading the insides of our of our delicate, uh, beautiful uh, arteries. And, and then those become inflamed just maybe almost by, if you could think of it, maybe as a chemically mechanical process, like little chemical scrub brushes just having... It's actually not bad. It's actually interesting. It's actually a little bit different, Chris. So what happens is because we have these weird, dense, small LDLs, and that's totally abnormal for humans to have because we're not supposed to have high sugar and trans fats. So it becomes like an antigen, a foreign substance that the immune system must react oh, to. Oh, yeah. So once you're small and dense, and then, the, and then the hyperglycemia, the high blood sugar continues, and the consumption of sugar continues, the small, dense LDL become radicalized. And these oxidized, small, dense LDL, the immune system recognizes as an antigen, and they initiate a low-grade, which will literally be a low-grade autoimmune reaction, and that's what's taking place in vessels around the body, wherever it happens to be. And furthermore, what's very interesting is that you can have all these changes, and think about where they draw the blood from. They draw the blood from veins, and you never have 
atherosclerosis in veins. It's only in the arteries. If you transplant a vein to where an artery was and it starts to function like an artery, it will develop atherosclerosis because the turbulence initiates a reaction. Mm-hmm. And But normally, the body is supposed to deal with the reaction and not create placking. But when we have oxidized, small, dense LDL, the reaction doesn't turn off. The chronic inflammatory process in the vessel wall does not turn off, and that is what leads to the clogging event. Fascinating. Fascinating. Thank you for that description. Uh, That makes a lot of sense to me. Now, let's finish up on the lipids. We've mentioned a couple of them, but there's, you know, there's a lot of people are interested in omega-6 versus omega-3. You mentioned a trans fat. So, so let's break down lipids a little bit in their role. Uh, we already understand that, uh, obviously, if we just clog our system with any kind of li- lipid, no matter how wonderful, uh, we aren't ready for that uh, digestively, and so that can lead to some of its own issues. But uh, within the world of fats, obviously, there's been a lot of confusion. You know, it was, tr- you know, uh, we were we were actually spreading trans fats on our on our uh, on our toast for health reasons, and then that didn't turn out to be a good idea. Help us understand lipids. So we have, um, um, in, t- in terms of fats, I think I'd say fats, well, lipids would include cholesterol and then, and then other fats and oils. Okay. So, but, but, so we'll look at the, at the fats and oils. So you have like olive oil, and then you have, say, butter. And each of them is made up of saturated and unsaturated fatty acids. And they call the unsaturated fatty acids mono or poly. So people say, well, you know, olive oil is really good. And they say it's really good because it has a lot of monounsaturated fatty acids. It's called oleic acid. About 75% of olive oil is this monounsaturated fatty acid. About 15% of olive oil is saturated. And uh, 10% roughly is polyunsaturated. And that's where you have the omega-6, omega-3 breakdown. So when we look at olive oil, it's very simple. When we look at, say, corn oil, which then became margarine because of the way they hydrogenate it. Corn oil contains, I, th- I think, about 15% uh, saturated. I forget the exact amount mono, but it has about uh, 60% polys, which means a tablespoon of corn oil is 60% omega-6. Never in mankind's history were we ever exposed to that. In fact, in, in, in the old days, they only used... Butter, when that became available, they used olive oil and they used coconut oil. All these other oils were used for me- uh, mechanical lubrication, machinery, mm-hmm. and illumination. They were never used for anything else besides that. They're cheap, easy to grow, so we consume them. So the omega-6s, the polys that are omega-6, it has to do where the first double bond is. And so omega-6 is just a fatty acid and it's down concentrated, and I'll give you the, the big list. So corn oil, safflower oil, sunflower oil, um, was not the big one, um, uh, sunflower, safflower, corn oil, cottonseed oil, peanut oil, and soybean oil. They have way high omega-6s. You're supposed to have a dietary balance. You want to be below 4 to 1. Each of those is well above 4 to 1. In fact, safflower, sunflower, they have virtually no omega-3, and they're almost pure omega-6. So when we eat omega-6 fatty acids, our body takes the, 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 the seed oil omega-6 and converts it into a larger omega-6 fatty acid. It's called, so, so we convert it from a linoleic into a arachidonic, and then arachidonic in our body becomes part of our cell membranes, and when the body gets perturbed, the body converts the arachidonic acid into prostaglandin E2, and prostaglandin E2 causes pain and inflammation. So we literally eat pain by eating those foods. We literally eat pain and inflammation if we eat uh, corn-fed, grain-fed cattle. Now, here's another thing about drugs. If I take an NSAID for my, my joint pain or my osteoarthritic pain, I'm inhibiting the enzyme that converts the dietary arachidonic acid into the prostaglandin. Say that again. So if I eat corn oil, safflower, sunflower... I will, I will eat that, and my body will convert the linoleic acid into arachidonic acid. And if I eat grain-fed animal products, I will get preformed arachidonic acid. And that has to go somewhere. It goes into cell membranes. And when the body gets perturbed, whether it's a subtle or a more dramatic injury, the body uses the arachidonic acid in the cell membrane to produce prostaglandins. So when you have joint pain and you take an NSAID and the pain gets better is because you have too much dietary 
omega-6 fatty acids in cell membranes within the body. Well, that's amazing that, that corn oil is, is 60% of that omega-6. Now, epidemiologically, we should be able to, to detect this. Of course, there is the, the so-called Mediterranean diet, which is correlated with lower heart disease and whatnot. But you're mentioning a pain pathway. Is there anything epidemiologically to suggest that um, people f who are eating the Mediterranean diet or perhaps live there uh, have lower uh, um, incidences of, of chronic pain or, or the types of pain management that are more prevalent maybe in other areas? The data is pretty weak in that regard, so you have to look at it from the pure chemistry perspective. So, you know, unfortunately, there's just not a lot of data on dietary change or lifestyles and pain expression. But we do know this when it comes to pain expression. Uh, anybody who has metabolic syndrome or their body mass index starts to rise up, they're the odds favor that they're going to experience more pain. And that's all across all joints. That's disc herniation in the neck and the low back. That's tendon pain, tendinopathy, as they're called, and the, the, the knee, the ankle, the elbows, the shoulder. Uh, that'll be widespread pain, like someone might think they have fibromyalgia, and they've just got this chronic inflammatory state related to this metabolic syndrome. That's much more uh, documented. So if you're living a lifestyle where you do not eat those foods, you would be less likely to express those pains, but they haven't done the kind of study that you're talking about. Okay, but the, certainly the uh, uh, incidence of heart disease and other things like that has been pretty well correlated. Oh, very, oh yeah, absolutely. absolutely. Right. And, and much of what I understand about heart disease, specifically if it's around uh, the atherosclerotic process there, um, we're talking about uh, that is an inflammatory process in your mind at this point, right? Yeah, that is the, the, the oxidized small... Uh, small dense well, the oxidized small dense LDL that are the drivers of it. Okay, so th so great. So we've been through sugars, we've been through um, carbohydrates, we've been through the lipids or fats. What about proteins? Uh, you and I had a very interesting conversation the other day, and it was around uh, everybody's favorite protein du jour, uh, gluten. Uh, talk to us yeah. about talk to us about that that interesting compound. Yeah, gluten's a problem. Um, you know, again, humans were not really exposed to these to these grains until the last couple hundred years or so. Well, actually, grains more like a thousand, I suppose. I don't know the exact timing on it. Um, but when we consume gluten, gluten is is made up of uh, individual molecules called gliadins and glutenins. And when the GI tract is exposed to the the, the gluten proteins, the gluten uh, peptides, they stimulate a reaction in the gut cell wall that causes the actual body gut cell wall cells, the, 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 they're called enterocytes. So our body produces this chemical called zonulin when we eat gluten. And zonulin breaks down the barrier between the very important intestinal cells and allows for antigens from food and bacteria to be absorbed, causing a, an immune response in the gut. If you're unlucky, you get celiac disease. If you're, uh, well, if you're unlucky, you can get really nasty gluten sensitivity syndromes like chronic headaches and depression. And, and the list goes on and on, actually. Widespread pains, uh, numbness and tingly type of, uh, they're called neuropathies. Um, and some people get no reaction like that, but they still get a low-grade inflammatory response. So when we consume gluten, it binds to the, the, the gluten receptor in the gut, and it causes the gut, so, the, so the, the gluten causes the gut cell to produce this chemical called zonulin. And, and, and your listeners can just Google or uh, Google gluten and zonulin, and we'll see these papers show up, and it's sort of shocking. So the gluten protein causes the gut to get leaky and allows for these antigens to come through. And the... The, the, the gene, the chromosome that, 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 that zonulin is related to is related to is chromosome 16, which is related to multiple different diseases like autoimmune diseases, cancer, multiple sclerosis. It's a certain autoimmune disease as well. So some people can get these awful illnesses because of gluten consumption throughout their lifetime. And so you know, if a rheumatologist was listening to this or maybe a neurologist, oh, this is crazy. But it's well documented, actually. The problem is that it's not, it's not like you, know, you sprain your ankle, you, you, it hurts. You don't like, eat a bagel and get you know, a, a neuropathy. It takes mm -hmm. time. You don't eat a bagel and go, God, I've got rheumatoid arthritis yesterday. How did this happen? It happened, I just did it yesterday. It takes several decades before you really, the body transforms. I mean, the body literally transforms from a normal humanoid state. There are very few of us less, by the way. 
into an inflamed human that is disposed to multiple diseases, and gluten pushes that because it's, it's, it, it initiates a, you know, an immune reaction. And because we keep eating gluten again and again, again, we keep pushing the reaction. All right, so let me get back to my bell curve of humans. Is this just some people are sensitive to gluten? or Because uh, I know some people, when they eat gluten, they get, they get flat out sick. So they get that instant uh, cause and effect response that allows them to tie it and say, wow, that's bad, I'm not going to do that. You know, I would not purposely sprain my ankle every day. So, so they're on it. Or would you say that this is something where everybody has a response or a reaction to it? It's just some are subclinical and, and, and do not present, but that there's always some inflammation going on. Everybody is, is, is going to have a, an immune response to it. The, 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 immunocyte, the immune cells release this cytokine called interleukin-15 in everybody. So everybody reacts to it, but not everybody gets symptoms from it. Now, with that being said, if you look at gluten, which comes in wheat, and what's really kind of interesting just for fun, do you know what gluten protein its name is? No, I don't. It's spelled S-E-I-T-A-N. Satan? <laughs> there you go. You said it right. <laughs> here's how they say it. <laughs> here's how they say it in the health store. No, it's called Satan. Uh-huh. <laughs> really. That that'd be like me saying that my name is C a man. My name is Seaman. You can imagine the jokes that I've had to deal with, I, right? I no, 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 my name is C a man. <laughs> So it's called Satan. So gluten is Satan. So I think that's kind of humorous. So where do we get gluten from? We get it from wheat, rye, and barley. And if you look at the, the nutritional profile of wheat, rye, and barley compared to vegetables, it's a disaster. People will say, oh, uh, but you get good fiber there. No, you get almost no fiber compared to vegetation on a caloric basis. And what we also get almost none of in, 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 in our grains across the board and which includes the gluten grains, is potassium. And potassium is a very important mineral that has gone from the, you know, our, in our Paleolithic days, we consumed up to 10,000 milligrams per day. Mm -hmm. Now we're 2,000. Hmm. And that's a violent, low, I say violent, I'm exaggerating. It leads to progressively more robust, low-grade inflammatory processes that eventually lead to stroke, heart disease, whatever it might be. Hmm. So this sounds like, uh, obviously, diet, a uh, very important role in either promoting or suppressing inflammation. So this all sounds very complex. Are there, are there simple rules for eating then? Is this the paleo diet? Does that, does that make sense? Uh, you know, we've seen all these diets come and go, right? You know, the ketogenic diets, you've got your Adkins and whatnots and, and uh, other diets where, uh, you know, people are going pure vegan. Uh, what, what do you think is in your experience that in what you've seen, What's the what's a middle path? Where's where's a place for somebody to start on thinking about how to go about eating now? Well, I, I think that people need to sit down and have a chat with themselves in in their brain. Yep. They need to, you know, they need to sit down and say, okay, last night, because um, a lot of people will not eat dessert or not overeat on the night, you know, the previous night. They don't wake up in the morning going, God, I wish I would have eaten more last night. You know, <laughs> I should I should have had that third. You know, I should have eat three three pieces of pie as opposed to none. So, so people have to have talks to themselves about, about their behavior. That's the most important thing. So you need to look at this from a, from a non-emotional per perspective. And, and, and what they should do is you know, get, get some blood work done, look at their body waste measurements, get these measurements and find out. And if they want, if they want to, they can just Google my name, David Seaman, BMI, pain. A pa the first paper to appear, they click on those, and they can go through the paper, and they can see a, an entire checklist of things to look at. They can bring that to their physician and say, I want to get normal. So what they should do is say, I want to be a normal human. How do I do this? Well, sugar and flour and wheat and all the rest of stuff is not going to get me normal. So what's going to get me normal? What do we eat historically? And I would, and I would say the paleo diet, but I don't like naming diets based upon a guy's last name, Atkins diet. That's kind of dumb. Uh, I mean, I don't, I don't mean dumb, and, but it's, what does it mean? It just means this guy it's, it's eat, eat a lot of fat, and, and it confuses people. The idea should be to eat healthy anti-inflammatory foods, and that means, if, to the best of our ability, lean proteins. And that can mean fish, chicken, across the board, and you can, the fatty fish are fine because they're actually rich with omega-3s. Uh, eggs are great. I would go with omega-3 eggs. So stick with those healthy proteins and then lots of vegetation. And that means green vegetables, more green vegetables, and then fruit. The best fruits are really berries. And if you're still hungry for a snack, have small, small, you know, handful of nuts. 
and then a lot of water, and avoid the sugar, the flour, the omega-6s, the trans fats. Mm -hmm. And so that diet that I just described will actually push you into ketosis. Now, the ketogenic diet, the problem with that is that they made it like drink, you know, eat butter and drink cream and, you know, just eat bacon. That's, that's crazy. The humans never did that. You get into slight ketosis doing what I just described. So their goal should be to, you know, get to be at least 80% healthy in terms of their choices. So it would be lean meats, fish, chicken, etc., vegetables, fruits, nuts, and then very small amounts of, 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 of whole grains and legumes. Now, my well, that sounds like obviously very good advice. And uh, I was talking with an herbalist who, a uh, long practicing herbalist, and, and his, his tagline was that health begins in the kitchen. And one of the things that he recommended people start to do is to, is to bring um, more of the capsaicin and turmeric-related spices in because those were anti-inflammatory, that if you looked at uh, places where people's diets were rich in in those spices, uh, culturally speaking or geographically, that that you would see uh, certain disease markers had lower incidences. So, uh, are those are those actually anti-inflammatories in in your mind? And and is that good advice too? Yes, and um, thank you for bringing that up because that's the other big thing. Spice the meals like spice everything. <laughs> spice everything as much as you can take is the best way to do it. Every morning. Well, not every morning, but most days uh, I'll either make make a vegetable juice where I'll do huge pieces of ginger, or I'll do a blender kind of like one of those one of those um, I forget what they're called uh, a juicer. The, the, yeah, a juicer, but it's the blendy thing. I just forget what it's called now. So it's, it's a Nutribullet. <laughs> Nutribullet Vitamix is fine. I broke my Nutribullet because I put too much kale in there. So <laughs> I use a I, I use a Ninja which has Blaze. So yep. I put raw kale big chunks of ginger, entire lemons and limes, and blend the whole thing up to get all those, 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 those bioflavonoids. Now, the reason the ginger is highly anti-inflammatory, turmeric, highly, all your spices around the world are highly anti-inflammatory. So people should spice as much as they want. Let's just assume they don't have, like they're not on, for example, a drug like Coumadin, which is a blood thinner. If you're on multiple medications, it's kind of sad, Chris, but... If you're on multiple medications, you need to talk to your medical doctor to see if getting healthy is safe for you. Oh, gosh. That is kind of sad. Uh, but yeah. good advice, obviously. I mean, there can be a lot of uh, contraindications and, and side effects, and who knows what happens there. So, uh, exactly. Yes. Yeah, so, uh, but for people who I think that, you know, this is just fantastic. What, what rings true from here is this idea of just getting normal again, because uh, the more, you know, as a past scientist, you know, studying just how complex the body is and looking at the ability that, that our body can tell self from not self is such an extraordinary feat of engineering that if it goes a little haywire, I, 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 I'm totally okay with that. The idea here, though, is to not be poking at it, prodding it, and, and forcing it to go haywire when it doesn't have to because it's extraordinarily good what, what our uh, immune system can do, but it's a very finely tuned system, so you don't want it to be doing inappropriate things. Autoimmune diseases are among the worst things I know about uh, because it's uh, there's no escaping yourself in, in that story. So. Uh, that all makes perfect sense to me. And uh, your website is dflame.com. Uh, but we mentioned before you have a new book coming out. Uh, when's it coming out and, and uh, who would benefit from it? Well, it's going to be written for the general public. It'll be, it'll be somewhat challenging, I guess, to get through in certain parts. And I say that only because pe people get confused, like, well, what's good to take this? Should I take this for that or should I take that for this? That's a real problem. You don't take something for a condition that's caused by an underlying chronic inflammatory state. So it'll be very educational, uh, and it'll be they'll, they'll have chemistry in there, but it'll be explained in a in, in a way that will make sense. So it'll be written for uh, laymen. Uh, it'll be written for uh, you know uh, high school grads, college grads probably will probably do best with it. And my goal is to have it out. Wow. Oh, like I'm about two thirds of the way through it. I'm really working hard to get it done as best. So hopefully two months, three months max. Mm -hmm. Well, fantastic. We're going to look forward to that, and of course we'll announce it. Uh, you, you'll let us know, and we'll announce it on our site to our listeners because this is a really important topic. And and the more I delve into this, the more I realize health does begin uh, with what you eat, and that our bodies are tuned for health. That's their normal condition, but we're not doing that. Uh, normal condition much favors uh, with with the types of things we've been putting in there. And of course, we're learning more and more about this. And, and we don't have time for it. But but the other part I would love to uh, maybe later on connect with you is the idea of, of how our gut flora and that whole balance uh, is really, really essential to our, our health. That In fact, we're not 
I am not Chris the human. I am Chris the human plus 100 trillion other things. And we live in balance, and there's a symphony there. And if that symphony becomes discordant or, or, or very, very much out of balance, that uh, that itself can become a, uh, a real impactor of my condition and health and sense of well-being and all of that. And I'm sure diet plays a huge role in keeping that balance well going as well. So um, love to talk to you uh, just real quickly so I know. Uh, is that a part of the story that you've been looking into? Absolutely. Oh, yeah. So we don't have time for that, but uh, we're going to. So so let's bookmark that and have that conversation because that seems to be uh, just a, an extraordinary new field that, that's just opening up. So again, reminding us as humans, there's a whole lot we know, a whole lot we don't know, and uh, there's a whole lot we ought to know because the data is there, the observations are there, and uh, we're just not taking advantage of them in many cases. So uh, with that, David, thank you so much for your time today. Oh, thanks for having me on. It's great to do it.